Hi, this is Danielle Karapkin speaking to you from Thornhill, Ontario, the Bayat. Um, we are studying Morina Vuchim, and we are in the middle of the third section, chapter two. Um, just to get our bearings, we had an extensive discussion last time talking about the Rambam's understanding of the Maase Merkava of Ezekiel's uh, vision in chapter one, um, which according to the Rambam, is really a, a prophetic depiction of all of scientific reality, but particularly how, are you able to hear me now, Elaine? Um, someone's telling me that they can't hear me. Are you able to hear me? Well, I'm going to I'm going to continue uh, speaking because um, my computer tells me that I am transmitting sound. So I'm hoping that it's the error is from that individual's end. Um, in any event, um, we are studying this section where the Rambam has been explaining to us how the Prophet Ezekiel is really describing how the cosmos interact with our um, terrestrial realm. And up until now, the, uh, the, the, the guide has been providing us with information about um, the chayot that is part of Ezekiel's vision. And the four chayot, the four angelic beings that are described that are have, each one of them has four faces, according to, um, according to, uh, um, is he, according to the Rambam, is really depictive of the four globes or celestial uh, uh, units that provide influence into our world. And now the Rambam is going to shift gears in the middle of chapter two to explain to us the next part of the vision. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to be providing um, uh, my screen. So those of you who uh, have the ability to um, to see my screen will be able to to see where I'm going with this. Um, I'm, I apologize that um, someone who's watching is not able to really see, is not able to really hear me, but I believe that I am recording. So I'm going to continue under that assumption. Okay. All right, so what we have here in our handout for today, and by the way, as I say every time, anyone is uh, uh, welcome to download the handout that uh, because it's available online. You can find it either in the Facebook group Shiur in Morena Vuchim, or you are also free to, um, to, 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 to download it. Um, here, let me just see if, um, make sure that my settings are, are working. Here, here's what I'm going to do. Yeah, it seems like all of my settings are working. So I apologize uh, to the person who's having problems hearing me, but it says that my settings are working. So I'm going to work under that assumption. Okay, so let me share the screen again, again with apologies for the delay. Okay, so what we're going to be focusing on in today's discussion, today's brief discussion, is Yechezkel chapter 1, verses 15 through 26. It's not even actually going to take us to the end of the chapter, but here, after discussing the chayot, um, the prophet Ezekiel works now on the ofanim. The word ofanim usually is translated as wheels. Uh, but it's also translated as a different category of angel, because we say it in our prayers, that the Ofanim and the Holy Chayot, two different classes of angels, aspire to reach the, end, the level of the Seraphim, which is a different category of angels. And yet in this vision, the Ofanim are, are described as being round, and having some attachment to the chayot. 
um, and they, they also have their own faces. Now, in order for us to appreciate where the Rambam is going with this, we're going to see that the Rambam views the Ofanim as a, as a metaphor for the way that the celestial spheres, the celestial realm uh, influences the very, very highest level of our sublunary realm. And those Ofanim trickle down and provide us with all of sublunary reality, all of the reality that we encounter in our world that is below the celestial spheres. And these Ofanim are actually descriptive of some, of some elemental material that trickles down into our world and forms not only the four base elements that Aristotle subscribed to, but also all of the compound materials that are combinations of elements, including all of inorganic life, all plant life, and all of animal life. So in order to appreciate this, we have to really understand that Aristotle subscribed to this idea that the formation of the base elements comes about through the motion of the celestial spheres. And in some way, the motion of the celestial spheres and their planetary bodies and their, 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 uh, their stellar bodies somehow transmit or emanate some influence that trickles down into our world and causes motions that bring about the, all of the form to the matter that exists in this world. And I'm just reading a little bit of a snippet from just a website that tries its best to describe what Aristotle believed. Aristotle described the four elements of the world and nature. Earth, being the heaviest element, is the lowest of all of the elements. And he's going to be describing the four elements as being layered over our, uh, layered within our terrestrial existence. The lowest is the earth, and that's through observation. You notice that land is the lowest thing in the world because you have land even under bodies of water. Then the next level up is water. Then above water is air. And then Aristotle believed that there was a layer of invisible fire above the air cover, and that was what provided warmth to our planet. It wasn't the sun per se. The sun was a source of influence to the element of fire, but there was an invisible layer of fire that surrounded the air layer that surrounds our planet, and that is what causes warmth in our world. And, uh, and to determine whether the body is light or heavy, Aristotle believed lightness was the nature of moving away from the center, and heaviness was the nature of moving toward the center of our terrestrial existence. The elements, when combined, created qualities. Fire and earth would create the quality of dryness. Water and water would create cold. Water combined with air would result in wetness. And finally, air and fire would be heat. Aristotle took it one step further and with his observations of motion. Aristotle postulated that, um, Aristotle postulated that all bodies have a natural way of moving, which could be regular or irregular. He believed that everything that moved was moved by something. The latter is only possible when the irregularity of the movement proceeds from either the mover or from the object moved or both. Basically, this is saying bodies could naturally move in a straight line or not at all. This idea is actually a rudimentary form of Newton's first law of motion, that an object will remain at rest or in uniform motion in a straight line unless acted upon. So basically, um, the, the, how do you account for the motion of the elements? So the motion of the elements were, is, 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 uh, occurs through the fact that they are being moved by something else. And as we'll see, that they, the elements are being moved and are constantly in rotation, uh, he believed. Air is constantly moving, fire is constantly moving, the waters of the earth are rotating around uh, together with the earth based on the influence of the celestial bodies. He also introduced a third option, which was circular motion. And he felt that this was the influence once again uh, because of the celestial bodies who bring about the most perfect of motion. Aristotle noted that the motion of the body moving upward would be fire or air. 
and downward would be water or earth. This would mean the objects that could be affected by circular motion must be of an exalted, exalted substance. Circular motion is connected with more heavenly bodies such as planets. The planets that were allowed to be in circular motion were spheres. These planets revolve around an earth. And here, just to give you a little bit of, a, of, a, of an illustration, here you have a, um, an illustration that I just happened to pick up. You have the center, which is earth, because that's the closest, the heaviest of the materials. Around that is a layer of water that covers much of our planet. And above that, you have a layer of air or wind. Above that, you have an invisible layer of fire. And then you have a material or a substance called that some uh, texts call ether. But it's, a, it's not one of the four elements. It's a different kind of element that makes up the cosmos, which... The Rambam doesn't get into too much, although the Rambam did tell us in several places that the material that makes up the cosmos, while physical, is of a completely different elemental makeup than the elements that we encounter in our world. And then you have uh, on the outer ridge is the prima mobile or the prime mover, which is, according to the Rambam's depiction, is the Ribono Shel Olam, God himself. Now, with all of this introduction, now we're going to bring it back to the verses in Ezekiel to sort of find out what is going on, uh, how the prophet Ezekiel is describing these ofanim. The first description is that of a unitary ofan. This is because, and if, if we look carefully in the text in Ezekiel verse 15, you'll notice that he speaks about only one ofan. Va'era hachayot, I saw the chayot, v'hinei ofan echad ba'aretz etzel hachayot le'arba'at banav. And there was one ofan that was facing down towards the earth, and it was adjacent to the chayot in all of its four faces, which is in itself a bit of a bizarre depiction. It's all bizarre, but right, in other words, we have to try our best to make, uh, make sense of it. So this is because in the Aristotelian model, the first physical item that emanates from the celestial spheres, spheres is prime matter, which is unformed and therefore does not have any elemental qualities. So the way that Aristotle depicted how the elements come into being is that first there's this prime matter, which does not have any characteristics of either fire, water, air, or earth. It's just un without form at all. It is a spin-off or a, a, an emanation from the celestial realm. And as it gets further and further into our terrestrial um, uh, boundaries, it starts to break off into four basic elements. In the verse, the Ofan is adjacent to the Chayot, nam namely the celestial globes or spheres, being their first emanation. In the very next verse, in verse 16, the one Ofan becomes four Ofanim with four faces. And that, again, is one of those strange things about this, the text. The very next verse says, tarshish, that the appearance of the Ofanim and their structure looked like Tarshish, a form of hard rock. Udemut echad la'arbatan. And they, they, all of them had the same, all of them had the same kind of vision. Umar ehen, and it seemed that that their images was one ofan embedded within another ofan. So we'll get to that in a minute. So uh, in the next verse, the one ofan becomes four ofanim with four faces. This refers to the emanation process whereby prime matter acquires form and breaks off into the four basic elements which form the surroundings of our sublunary realm. The Ophanim's faces are not described as having any form. This is because the elements possess neither sentience nor independent animation, as will be explained. So what the Rambam wants to make a point of telling us is that in his understanding of the verses of Yecheskel, they are describing the Ophanim, which he says is the code word for the formation of the, the prime matter, which breaks up into the four elements. But the four faces that are attributed to the Ofanim is, uh, is not given any kind of depiction. In other words, with the Chayot, you had a depiction of the four faces. One was uh, a human face, one was the face of a shore, one was the face of uh, uh, an ox, one was the face of a lion, one was the face of an eagle. 
But over here, none of the faces of the Ofanim are actually being described. And that's because a face represents independent intellect or sentience. And here, even though the elements have a face because they have um, uh, formal, let's say, uh, features in that you have, there are certain distinct features to air, distinct features to water, etc. But over here, the elements do not possess sentience. And sentience was this vital ingredient that the Rambam felt that, that, that according to Aristotle is ascribed to the Chayot or the celestial spheres, that they willfully and knowingly bring about influence into our terrestrial realm. Um, the Ofanim's faces, again, because they, uh, so again, the next, then the next point is the reason why the elements are called wheels is because they move in a circular motion around our planet, as we talked about before. Now, in verse 17, he then, the, the prophet says that, sorry, um, we mean to say verse 18, the gabehen v'gova lahem, the year alahem, that they had a certain kind of, of height um, and uh, and they had a certain kind of appearance that was frightening. The gabotam mileot enayim saviv la'arbatan. And their, their, uh, the nature of their bodies is that it was filled with eyes, enahim, eyes, that surrounded all four of these elements. Now, what does that mean, that their bodies were filled with eyes? So he also makes clear that the four faces are actually the four wheels. And he also states that the ofanim were encased and enmeshed in each other, which is what we saw in verse 16. This is a description that does not occur for the chayot, for the chayot are merely described as adjacent to each other, but not enmeshed and embedded within each other. So according to the Shem Tov commentary, this description, even though the Rambam doesn't say it explicitly, refers to the four base elements combining with each other to form compound materials. So when it says that one ofan would embed itself in the other ofan, right, it really means that air and water and earth and water and earth and air and fire and water and fire and earth all of these things combine to create compound materials which is how we come about come which is how we encounter all the different kinds of materials and substances in our existence how do we understand the ophanum being filled with eyes so there are four possibilities Number one, it could be in the Rambam writes that eyes are meant literally. And as the Shem Tov says, because the Rambam does not elaborate on this point, is when elements combine, this brings rise to animal and human life, which literally possess eyes as well as other organs. So the word eyes could just be mean an example of the various organs that living creatures possess who are themselves a combination of the various different elements mixed together in the proper proportion. The word ayin, I, can sometimes mean multicolored or multifaceted. That's the second interpretation. Because when the Torah describes the manna, the man, in the book of Numbers, it says, ve'eno ke'en habidolach, that its appearance was, or its color, was that of bedilium. And so that or is so so therefore what you see is is that it's referring to the um the the nature or the the way that it presents itself to the eye. And so therefore all it means is that it had multiple facets to it, these elements. And that's what it means is because these elements can be broken down and combined uh, with other elements to create a multifaceted sense of nature. And the third interpretation, is that the word ayin could mean just having a semblance or form, in that when the elements combine, they form creatures with a unique likeness. This is akin to the Talmudic dictum that Omar Rav Karen Ke'en Sheganav, that it means it's like and when, when a person steals, he has to pay back what the object that he stole was worth at the time when he stole it. Ke'en, it's got to be like the time that he stole it. So the word Ayin simply means like or likeness. It has a unique likeness, each one of the elements. And finally, the word ayin 
could refer to a state of being since each compound material has a unique disposition and makeup. So the word ayin can, can mean a number of different things, but it's not meant to be taken literally unless you learn that it's referring to how the elements combine to create all manners of life of organisms that possess eyes. Next, the motion of the ofanim is what the Rambam discusses next. Ezekiel states that they were moving in a circular motion, lo yisabu belechton, without deviation. And as the Shem Tov explains, this is because, as established when discussing the celestial spheres, perfect motion is circular. He also says repeatedly in the, in the, in the text, in the scripture, that the Ofanim do not, do not move of their own power, but rather the Chayot cause the motion of the Ofanim. This means that the celestial spheres give rise to the motion of the sublunary elements. And as the Rambam gives the analogy, it can be likened to what happens when one ties an inanimate body to the hands and feet of a living being. Every time the living being moves, the piece of timber or stone tied to the limb of that living being moves likewise. And as the Shem Tov says, this indicates that compound materials are brought into existence by the motions of the celestial spheres, since it is only through the movement of the elements to go either higher or lower that their nature allows for the elements to combine with each other. In other words, going back to that uh, diagram that we, that, we sh that we showed before, when we look at the depiction of Aristotle's layers of elements, how can the elements combine if they're all in their unique stations, earth being the lowest, and then there's a layer of water, and then a layer of air, and then a layer of fire. So how do they combine? It is through the influence of the stars, really, it's that the stars give rise to different types of motion, not only circular motion, but moving at a at a further away orbit or moving at or uh, at a um, closer orbit, and that causes some of the elements to combine with each other, so that not only are they moving in a circular fashion, but they're also moving up and down at the whim of the celestial bodies. Okay, now. So, so that's the next part. And this is consistent with what the Rambam says we already mentioned from Targum Yonatan regarding the movement of the celestial spheres. And the Rambam had talked about that, even though we're now on page 421 in the Pines edition, he had talked about that on page 420. And he said that uh, loosely translating the, the words of Targum Yonatan on verse 20, this means that the will of God causes the celestial spheres to move. And the celestial spheres, in turn, cause the elements to move, thus causing them to combine with other elements and bring about earthly phenomena, all ultimately occurring at the behest of God's will. And then finally, after describing the chayot, their forms and motions, the ofanim that are beneath them and their forms and motions, Ezekiel now, at the end of chapter 1, discusses a third vision, that which is above the chayot. And here the Rambam is perhaps the most terse and the most cryptic in his uh, in, in explanation of what the vision is all about, of describing what is above the Chayot. So we've talked about the Chayot. We've talked about the Ofanim, which are immediately below the Chayot. But the, the last part of the prophecy this is where Ezekiel describes what is above the Chayot. And he describes that there are three things above the Chayot. In verse 22, uh, Ezekiel says that there is a rakia, a firmament that is above the chayot, and that that firmament had a crystalline or ice-like appearance. Above the firmament was the likeness of a throne, demut kise, and that's in verse 26. And above the throne was a likeness as the appearance of a man, and that's in verse 26. And of course, that's the highest level of uh, Ezekiel's vision. And that, of course, is descriptive of the divinity itself, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the likeness of a man sitting or residing above everything, controlling the entire process. The Shem Tov commentary quotes two explanations as to what this all means, because the Rambam leaves this all unexplained. First, he quotes Rabbi Moshe Narboni, that above the four celestial globes is an additional sphere that contains no celestial bodies. It is rather like kerach, like ice or crystals, that is completely clear. And that's what the prophet really means to explain. He also quotes from Rabbi Shmuel ibn Tibon that both the firmament and the throne represent a celestial sphere 
that the Rambam has difficulty reconciling with his system of four. And I want to refer you back to our commentary on Mora Nevuchim, section 2, chapters 9 and 10. When we talked about those chapters, we mentioned that the Rambam seems to contradict himself, because in Hilchot Yesodei HaTorah, um, chapter 3, the Rambam describes more. He describes a series of nine celestial spheres. And here, he des- the Rambam describes that there are only four in order to make the celestial system be consistent with the prophecy of Ezekiel. So how does that, how does he finesse that? How does that end up working out? So it turns out that the Rambam, well, if you go back to that commentary, we explain how the Rambam is able to reconcile it in some way, but there seems to be a sphere that's left over after you create these four uh, units of combinations of different spheres. It's a sphere called the sphere of Aravot. The Galgal of Aravot is what the Rambam calls it. And that's what's being described in Ezekiel's vision as both the Rakia and the Kise, the firmament and the throne of God. Because uh, this uh, celestial globe is three-dimensional, this, glo- uh, this globe of Aravot, and it has an inner rim and an outer rim. The inner rim is this firmament, the outer rim is the throne closest to God, and then above that is the vision of God himself. And as the Shem Tov concludes, Ezekiel said that he had this vision on the Nahar Kevar, on the Kevar River. But he says that that's really an allusion to the flowing or the motion of all of creation, both in the celestial realm and how metaphysics trickles its way down to the physics of our realm and causes the motion of the elements and of everything in our planet. The word Kevar is a jumble of the words Rechev, the chariot system, so it's descriptive of the river, so to speak, or the flowing of the chariot system of God. And this is how the Rambam concludes the chapter. It's certainly how we're going to conclude the chapter. A lot of very um, mysterious information. And again, the Rambam feels compelled to uh, reveal only a portion of his knowledge and conceal the majority of it. And certainly, we're only certainly scratching the surface but at least we have a working understanding of what the Rambam is trying to communicate to us. The Aristotelian depiction of how elements come into existence in our planet as a result of the influence of the celestial bodies. Of course, very foreign to us, but nonetheless, the idea that and the project that the Rambam is engaging in, engaging in is to try to reconcile the science of his time with the Torah and the scripture of his time, which he feels, especially when it comes to physics and metaphysics, is extremely important. I hope that there's audibility here, otherwise I'm going to have to record this again, and uh, we'll hopefully see you next week. Uh, Let me wish you all a Chag chag Sameach for those of you who are celebrating the holiday of Shavuot this this Thursday evening. Take care now. Bye-bye.